So tonight we're going we're gonna to finish this uh, series with, uh, with a title, Prayer Without Limits. Amen. Prayer Without Limits. I'll tell you what, the size of the God you perceive is the measure of what you'll receive. Oh, I got to say that just one more time. The size of the God you perceive is the measure of what you'll receive. A lot of folks don't receive much because the God that they serve is not very big. Come on, somebody. See, the, uh, see uh, we, all, we, we all might say, yeah, we serve the same God, but we all have a different perception of who that God is and what that God is able to do. And you see, the more, the, the bigger your perception of God, the bigger things that will happen in your life, the miracles, come on now, you'll, be able, you'll ask for bigger things because your God is bigger in your sight, and it makes such a huge difference. See, you can only, only get from God what you expect from God. Oh, come on, that's a good place to say amen. See, what you expect is what you're going to get. So if you don't expect much, guess what? You're not going to get much. But if you expect God to bless you, you come in with a heart of expectation, then God not only will, will meet that need, but he'll surpass it. Amen? God is a God of the one-up. Turn to him and say, neighbor, he's always going to one-up you. So no matter how big you want it, God wants it bigger. Amen? No matter how much you want to be blessed, God wants to bless you even more than that. Because then he gets the glory because you only wanted this. And God says, see, I went, you went for this, but I went for this. Come on, somebody. And then when you get there, you go, whoa, wait a minute. I, I, was just, I just wanted my knees met. God said, I don't just want to meet your need. I'm going to give you abundance. Come on now. I want to give you increase. I want to give you more than you ever expected. And when God does that, everything begins to shift in our lives. You know, the, the, the spies in Israel, they saw giants bigger than them. And sadly, they saw the giants bigger than God. Because they decided not to walk into God's promise. And because they didn't, a 12-day 12, a 12 journey turned into a 40-year come on cycle. It should have just been a season. Come on now. How many know sometimes God will put you to a season, but we can turn it into a cycle? See, we can turn into a cycle when we don't learn what God and why he put us in a season. And then those seasons get extended much longer than they have to. See, many Christians, unfortunately, observe a Sunday-only God. Come on now. So God's work is limited in their lives. See, they, they, they visit God on Sunday, and they forget about him the rest of the week. See, God to them is a casual cohort and not a close companion. How many of you know when God is a close companion... You're with him every day. See, when you love God, you want to be with God all the time. Your conscience, you're aware of his spirit. You're always looking around. You're, you're always worshiping. You're, you, know, you know where to turn your radio. Come on, somebody. You know where to listen to Christian music. You know, you know where to, how to feed your faith on a regular basis because you want to spend time with God. It's not a chore to come to church. I mean, no, it's exciting to come to church. I tell you, I, I don't know, I love when the worship starts and the music starts and I can just block out the whole world and lift up my hands and begin to worship God. It like puts me in a whole different zone and, and the atmosphere begins to shift. I don't know about you, but I love coming to church. I mean, I'm addicted to church. Come on, somebody. I mean, I remember when I first got saved, that they, if the church would have been open seven days a week, I'd have been here seven days a week. They'd have to put a cot in the back of the place. It's the, I would sleep in church if they let me. Because I love the atmosphere. I love being around people of God. I love being around the presence of God as well. How many know here that, that probably you could probably expect more from a close friend than a distant acquaintance? Yeah. See, if you, if you have a close friend, you could probably ask them for favors that you couldn't ask somebody that you didn't know very well. Amen? Right. You know, there's a, there's a story about a little boy who wanted $100 really, really bad. He prayed for weeks, but nothing happened. So he decided to write a letter to God requesting $100. When the postal authorities received a letter addressed to God, comma, USA, they decided to send it to the president. Now, the president was so amused, they instructed his secretary to go ahead and send the little boy a $5 bill. Now, the president thought this would appear to be a lot of money to a little boy. Well, the little boy was delighted with the $5 bill and sat down to write a thank you note to God. Now, the postal authorities forwarded this letter to the president as well. And it read this. Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you sent it through Washington, D.C. 
Next time, send it straight to me. Those guys deducted $95 in taxes. <laughs> uh, see, perhaps the key to praying without limits. <laughs> Wait, I gotta stop on that a second. Perhaps the key to praying without limits is perceiving our God without limits. See, when you perceive a God that has no limits and you're praying to that God, then that extends your faith. That ex- Listen, you'll ask for bigger things. Come on, somebody. See, if you know God is a big God, then you won't be afraid to ask for things that are ridiculous, things that are absurd. Come on, somebody. Things that are just so over the top that everybody else around you says, man, you are absolutely out of your mind. And God's looking back from heaven going, come on, ask for that. Because all those folks that say you're, you're out of your mind, I'm going to show them, ha, hallelujah, that by connecting to me, they're going to be doing this going, whoa, wait a minute, what happened? He said, I, you thought I was out of my mind. I just serve a God that's bigger than anything you could imagine. So you thought it was crazy, but it was just God setting up a miracle, amen? So, so, so at the end of the day, the bigger we see God, the more the limits come off, the, the boundaries come off, and God does his thing. See, do you, let me ask you a question. Do you really have confidence that all things are possible to those that believe? See, do you believe that if you delight yourself in the Lord, that he'll give you the desires of your heart? See, do you trust that only, that only a mustard seed's worth of faith can move mountains? Oh, come on now. See, do, do you really believe that? Maybe it's time to stop focusing on the magnitude of the mountain and start focusing on the greatness of God. Start taking your eyes off the circumstances and putting on the one that can handle every single situation in our lives, amen? When we surrender it to God and give it to him, then he says, that's what I wanted you to do. Step out of the way. I'm ready to do something great and mighty. You just got to let it go. Turn to the person next to you and say, person, (laughs) you got to let it go. Don't hold on to something that God wants a hold of. See, don't hold on to what God wants to hold of, and you'll find that God will move in a great and mighty way. So my question to you tonight is this. What obstacles are you facing tonight? What are the enemies that are opposing you this evening? What are the walls that are keeping you from entering God's fullness? What are the barriers blocking you from God's blessings? What relationship, habits, or attitudes Have you stuck tonight? Well, you know what? Let's go to God's word. If you have your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Some of this scripture may be uh, uh, be, uh, familiar to some of you. It is Paul. It is a prayer. And it's so powerful because this prayer really is amazing. And I believe that this prayer that Paul prays, if we pray this prayer, then we'll start praying without limits. Come on, somebody. We'll start praying in a way that God will be able to move in greater ways. Because let me ask you a question. If you could pray something right now that would be guaranteed to happen, how big would that prayer be? I got quiet. Somebody, like, y'all afraid to ask for something huge? I mean, at the end of the day, people stop when they say that. You know why? Because they have to check their heart. They have to check their dreams. Because some of us are not dreaming big enough. Come on, somebody. Some of us are not dreaming big enough anymore. We, we've been squashed. We've gone through all this stuff. And then we stop dreaming because maybe we've had failures in our lives. Maybe we've had situations that didn't work out. Maybe we're, we're afraid to get excited about something because it may just lead us to another letdown. At the end of the day, you have to begin to dream again. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to dream big. You got to dream big. You got to start stepping out and exercising your faith because, listen, if, you, if you're shooting for the stars and you end up in the moon, you'll probably still be okay. At the end of the day, you'll probably still reach a level that is so amazing. And I know that God has all these great things planned for all of us, but he'll only go as far as your dream. Come on, you got to see it. Before you can be it. Come on, somebody. You have to be able to see it and visualize it. We talked about that last week as well. But Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, the word of God says this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him, come on now, who is able to do immeasurably. Some of your verses may say exceedingly, abundantly, come on, more than we all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everyone would shout, amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise. What a prayer. What a prayer. We're going we're to take this prayer apart, and we're going to dissect this thing. And I'm telling you, I, I, when I, as I was doing this study, my heart was jumping up and down. Listen, I believe in God for the ridiculous. Come on, somebody. I'm going to start with believing God for the absurd, for the dreams that you know that God planted early in, in your walk with God. Some of y'all, you, you got saved, and you saw yourself singing the Coliseum, preaching to people. You probably saw all kinds of things because you were so excited, and all of a sudden people just, and things changed, and you don't think that way anymore. Listen, if God put the dream in there, come on now, that means he can make it happen. But you have, but you have to believe. You have to, you have to believe it, and sometimes you got to pray to God to give you that belief. Come on. So you pray, God, work with me on this doubt in my heart. I need to get this doubt out. I want to be able to dream big and see big and mighty things happen in my life, in my family's life, in my children's life, in the ministry. Come on now. In every area of our life, the bigger we dream. Come on now. The bigger we dream, the bigger God can move in that area now. you Because you start pushing all the boundaries to the side, and God says, man, you start praying without limits. That means you take the limits off of me. Come on now. And you see, God is able to do all things. So we see, as, as we begin to minister here, I, I noticed a couple of things, a couple of observations as I was taking this, the, the, this particular prayer apart. First of all, this. This prayer focuses on your inner being, not your outer person. See, Paul is preaching or praying, should I say, that God will bless you on the inside. Why is that so important? Because when God's on the inside, it begins to overflow to the outside. Come on. God works from the inside out. So begins to pray that. See, so many of our prayers have to do with our physical needs. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for our physical needs. But here, Paul is more concerned with our internal being than our external self. The second thing I noticed about this prayer, it's also focused on the need for power. Everybody say power. power. See, the word power or strengthen is used four different times. And see, Paul is praying that we will utilize the divine, the divine power God made available to us. It's not about getting power, another, getting, going, plugging yourself into a source to obtain power. It's about getting the power that's already in you. Come on, somebody. How, do we have any born-again, saved, Bible-believing people in this room? Do we have some folks? If you're born again, then the Holy Spirit lives in you. Come on now. See, the power is already in you. You don't have to go somewhere else to get it. If you just understand that God lives on the inside, then he's pointing to the inside and saying, if you just realize what's already deposited, then you need to make a withdrawal. Come on, somebody. And when you start withdrawing what God has deposited, you'll see all kinds of wonderful changes happening in our lives. So tonight... We're going to discuss this prayer in three different parts. Let's start filling in the blanks. The first part is this. It's worship. How many, how many know starting a, a prayer session with God in worship is a good thing? Because you begin to praise him for who he is. We're not even talking about what he's done yet. We're just going to worship God and just lavish our praises over him. You know, I remember as uh, 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 Alana, when she was a lot younger, uh, she still does it now. But but when she wants something from daddy, she knows exactly how to do it. Come on now. She knows exactly how to do it. And I know she's doing it. She'll come up, hey, daddy. And I'm like, oh, here it comes. And she starts being real nice. Come on now. Do you want something? Can I get you something? Oh, yeah, some water. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll be right back. I'm going, she's setting me up. Come on now. But I'm cool with it. See, see, because when you, how many when you love somebody, 
even though you know they want something, you don't mind giving it to them if it's reasonable, right? If it don't cost too much, come on, somebody. <laughs> We're not dipping too hard in the pocket. So, so, so she comes up, and then she would sit next to me, and she would just start talking to me, and then she would, and then she would ask me. And I knew it was coming. I said, okay, what's up? What do you need? And she would tell me something. And I said, okay, is that what you need? No problem. If I could do it, why wouldn't I? When you love somebody, amen, you want to give them the things that they need, maybe even the things that they want at times because you love them. And if that makes them happy, come on now. So how much more... Come on, how much more the God in heaven who loved you so much that he gave his son. So imagine the measure of love we're talking about. How much more would his hands always be open when you ask for something? Oh, come on now. See, we don't have to fight for our blessing. God's hands are always open. Sometimes we're the ones that hold it back. But God is a generous God. Turn to the person next to you and say, person, he is generous. And that's why all of us are here, because he was so rich and generous in mercy and in grace that he oversaw all our sin, all our brokenness, all our issues. And he said, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, you didn't have to be good for him to die. He died so that you could become better. Come on, somebody. He died to, to be able to bring you in to the plan that he has for you as well. See, Paul reverently declares the greatness of God. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 says this. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. See, the first thing we notice is his position. He says, I kneel. I kneel. I mean, that's a, that's a, a posture of humbleness. See, the Bible never commands us to pray using a certain position, although the most common way to pray is standing up. When I went to Israel... I mean, you're standing at the wall, at the wailing wall. Everybody is standing up, and they're praying, and folks are rocking, and, and it's really amazing. But he does something different here. See, the Bible, when Paul says, I kneel, the direct translation from the Greek is this, I bend my knee before the Father. Come on. See, you may stand or sit and pray while you're reading your Bible, but there are times when out of desperation, come on now, when out of difficult situations, when, when we feel compelled to fall on our knees in humble, a humble posture of prayer. You know, I remember when I first came to Christ, I had so many battles going on. I mean, I got saved, but man, how many know that when you get saved, you're just changing directions? And now you're turning into a, a direction where, man, God is there, but every demon in hell is waiting for you right there too. And I remember I had to survive every day. Maybe some of y'all have never been here, but let me explain this. I had to survive. Prayer was not an option. Prayer was not something that I had to do just because it was a, it's a good idea to get closer to God. How many of you have ever had to pray to survive? Just to get through the moment. Forget day by day. I'm talking about minute by minute because everything is coming loose. You don't know where to go. It's so dark around you. And I remember that uh, going, home, uh, going to work was relief because while I was at work, I could get my mind off everything. I, I was a field engineer for IBM, and, and I fixed computers. And, and so I was busy all day long. But, man, when I came home at night, when they came off the road and walked in, I would just, all of a sudden, I felt like all the world's heaviness and all the challenges just came against me. And you know how I got through it? Somebody gave me a CD with some worship music on it. And I just did the same thing every night. I did this for weeks. I popped the CD in, hit play. Some of y'all know what a CD is, right? Okay, anyway. <laughs> it might have been a cassette back then. I don't know. Wait a minute. So I know some of folks have no idea what a cassette looks like. <laughs> but anyway, I would hit play. And literally, I would start hearing the worship music. And I was so burdened and so broken, I would kneel on the floor of my living room and I'd fall asleep. Because I wanted to sleep. I wanted God's presence. His presence would fill the room, and I would just go, oh, this is so good. Like, I need this every day because when I started thinking about everything I was dealing with, it was overwhelming. And when you've experienced that kind of prayer and, and how God walks you through it, you always know where to go. Come on now. You always know who your source is. When things get out of control, when issues go crazy around you, you know that God's presence is there. Paul begins to worship him here. And he says, man, this is awesome. Because when life gets too hard to stand, you just got to kneel. Mm. Paul then says this. 
from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. See, as creator, God is maker of everyone. But as savior, he's only the father to those that believe. So when somebody says, oh, he's all of our father. No, he's not. If you don't know Jesus, he's not your father. He's your creator. But your father, the Bible says that when we come to Christ, amen, and he gives us the permission, he gives us the access to be called children of God. See, now he become, you become, he becomes your father. But before then, he's not your father. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we were enmity against him. Before you came to Jesus, you weren't even his child. Most of us were enemies because we lived so contrary to God in our ways of thinking, in our actions. So we really weren't even close to being, being uh, friends of God. The Bible says we were actually enemies of God until we came to Christ. Come on, somebody. And then God pulled us in. And he, come, and he adopted us. Isn't that wonderful? And he, make us, he made us heirs. Oh, man, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. Because if he owns it, I own it. Come on, somebody. I own it. If, if my daddy owns it. Come on, I own it too. Oh, come on now. Some of y'all are going to get this in a minute. Some of y'all are going to start getting excited here in a second when this begins to sink in for real. <laughs> but God, the second thing is this. The second part of this prayer are petitions. The second part are his petitions. Paul brings his prayer requests before the Lord. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 says this. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that his love that surpasses knowledge, man, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a powerful prayer. How amazing is that? See, these are not individual requests. See, these four things that I'm going to talk about right now, these four specific requests that he makes here in this particular uh, passage, they're not individual requests. It's almost like a telescope. Anybody have a telescope? You ever, have, you ever had a telescope where you have to open it and then open it again, and there's like several pieces, that, that, and then you finally have it open? Come on, it's one of those cheap ones. Come on now. So, so some of y'all may have like a really nice, you know, electron microscope or telescope or something, you know, crazy. See the stuff. But we, you know, I grew up in the hood. Come on, somebody. So we, had, so we got the one that it was collapsible and you kind of poop, 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 poop. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on now. Some of y'all don't want to admit it. I know. That's okay. You don't have to. Y'all are too good now. You got saved and now you just, anyway, no. So, so he did it. So each section opens up to get a clear view of what God wants to do. In other words, Paul does not want us to experience just a, a portion of God, but to experience the limitless supply of God's glorious riches. The first request Paul makes is for strength. Fill in the blanks. It's for strength. His first petition is for God to give power and strength to the very core of your being through the Holy Spirit. See, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the evidence that you're saved. See, Romans 8, 9 says this, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Mm, come on. Are you glad you belong to him? Yes. Are, you glad, are you glad that he belongs to you as well? Are you glad that you gave, you gave your life to Jesus and you can see such an amazing impact? And you see the word translated power in the Greek here is the word duname, where we get the word dynamic or maybe dynamite. So in, the, in, in Acts chapter 2, it's dunamis. It's, it's dynamic. It's explosive. How many of the Holy Spirit, when he shows up, man, an explosion can happen. Come on, somebody. People get saved. I mean, all of a sudden moments happen when the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden things begin to shift. All of a sudden people are healed. All of a sudden people are delivered. All of a sudden people come to Jesus and they're saved. All of a sudden when the Holy Spirit shows up in power, it's like dynamite going off and everything begins to shift. And God can change everything in your life in an instant. Amen. In just one move of God and the Holy Spirit. The question is this. Do you ever feel spiritually weak? I know I do. There are times when I feel spiritually weak. 
you know, but many of us seek strength through friends and family members, and that's okay. We often wait till there's no one left to talk to before we turn to God. See, when you're going through something, the first thing you do is pick up the phone. Come on now. And you want to call somebody, hey, listen, uh, I want to talk to you. The thing is this, how many know you can pick up the line and call Jesus? Come on. He's always on the other line. See, the line is never busy when you call him. So you might call your friend, and you might, you might end up getting a text saying, hey, I'm busy, text me. Yeah. See, if y'all call me sometimes, I'll just hit the button. Because if I'm in a meeting, I just push a button. It says, and you get a text saying, hey, I'm busy right now. How many know that Jesus don't have that? Come on now. See, Jesus, well, he'll answer the phone every single time. And so many times we save God for last. Like it's our last resort. How many of you should be our first resort? Yeah. As a matter of fact, if he's your first resort, you might not need your family or your friends. How many of you know God, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the, the, he, can do all, he can do it all by himself. He don't need any help. But how, many, how about the becoming dependent on the Holy Spirit like that? See, when you read David and you read the Psalms, you could tell he had such an amazing relationship with the Spirit of God. You can tell how he writes and, and how he pours himself out to God. And, and that's just such an amazing thing to, I mean, he had nowhere to go after a while. He's like, man, I got enemies on this side. I got these people lying about me on this side. I mean, he's all by himself. But he knew, the Bible says, how to encourage himself yeah. in the Holy Spirit. And God would fill him, and he would begin, come on, he'd pick up his, 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 uh, his banjo, come on, somebody. His electric guitar, a harp, he just started playing that harp, he started playing music. How many of when you start playing worship music, demons got to go? Come on now. When you start worshiping the Lord, a lot of times you're feeling all this oppression and all, all this heaviness. Man, put on a worship CD. Man, sing that song, Worthy. That's, is that song amazing, that new song we just started doing? I love that song. Just lift up your hands and just begin to sing your favorite song. I'll guarantee you, you take a praise break, the devil's got to go. Come on now. The devil's got to go. He cannot be in that atmosphere. So when you feel that heaviness, pray and begin to praise. Lift up your hands. People might think you're crazy. At work, I used to go to the bathroom. When I'm all stressed out, I go, you know what, time for a little praise break. I'm going to the bathroom. And I, and I shut the door inside the stall, and I would lift my hands, and I would just stand there for like two minutes, and man, I would walk out charged up. Come on, because the Bible says that his presence becomes a shield about you. And all them demons were shooting, shooting those darts and those arrows, and they were just boom, bouncing off. Come on, somebody. I saw them coming, and I saw them hit. But they didn't impact because there's a shield about you. Come on, somebody. Because you don't allow somebody to steal your joy. You don't allow people to just walk in with their attitude and take you out of your game. Because the presence of God raises you up. So when these people, when these turkeys start talking trash, come on, somebody. They don't know they're talking to an eagle. Come on now. They have no idea they're talking to eagles. And if we don't like what they're doing, we just rise up above them, man. They better be careful. They might become our prey that day. Come on now. Woo. Uh, don't get violent on me, y'all. <laughs> but God is so good. And God, so when you're spiritually weak, where do you go? See, friends, only the, only the Holy Spirit can strengthen your spirit. Only God, only a spirit can touch your spirit. See, man, you can't counsel certain things out. You can, it can, you can hear things, amen, and that's great. And you can have peace when somebody talks to you about certain things. But when they start quoting scripture, why does that work? Why does scripture work? Because scripture is spirit. Come on, somebody. It's word. It's God's thoughts. It's, it's his word. It's God. It's life. Come on, somebody. So when you start reading the Bible, it's life. All of a sudden, your inner man goes, ooh, that's, that feels good. Because spirit touches the spirit. How many know deep cries out to deep? Yes, Come on. I mean, there's only so much that man can do or anyone around you, your family, even your wife and children. Hey, none of that matters. There's, only, there's a place that only God can touch. And we need to understand that God wants to touch that. He wants to be that close. See, he's the one who refreshes and revitalizes and renews us. I love when Peter wrote in the book of Acts, he said, times of refreshing. When the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, this is a, a time of refreshing. When the Holy Spirit begins to rain on you, when it begins to shower on you, all of a sudden there's this fresh air. It's like, it's like going out after a rain. Come on now. After a rain in the evening, you step outside, and it just smells good. It smells clean. See, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to create around you, an atmosphere that when you step into it, man, it just revives you and it strengthens you. And, you know, and he does it on the inside where God dwells and where God works.
2 Corinthians 4.16 says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul's second request is for depth. Ephesians 3.17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. See, here Paul uses three pictures to convey the idea of spiritual depth when he chooses these three verbs, dwell, rooted, and established. The first word, dwell, is a, com a compound form of two Greek words, kata and oikos. Kata meaning down and oikos meaning house. It literally means this, to settle down and feel at home. Come on, somebody. Amen. See, God, Jesus doesn't want to come to be a guest. He doesn't want to come just to visit. He wants to become a resident Amen. in your home. He wants to move in with you. Come on now. Hallelujah. He wants to be able to access every door in the house. He wants to be able to go to the refrigerator. Come on now. You know, come on. He doesn't want to be a guest that says, can I, can, he's going to be, he wants to be part of it. He wants to be connected to you 100%. So when it says dwell, it means I want to come in and feel at home and settled in your heart. Come on now. The second word is rooted, which is from the plant world. See, just as a tree must have roots deep in order to communicate, hallelujah, you know, in order to, uh, to deep into the soil to be nourished and stable, we as believers must also have our spiritual roots deep into the love of God. It's the love of God. See, a lot of folks, I mean, the word of God is amazing. The word of God is awesome. But how many of the word of God continues to do what it has to do in our lives? But it's the love of God that brought you in. Come on now. It might have been the fear of God at first. Come on, somebody. I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to accept Jesus. But it's the love of God that keeps us. Sometimes I'm leading worship here on this platform, like even last Sunday when we were singing that song, Worthy, and something just came over me. How I many know sometimes there's just a realization of God's love? Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm standing up here leading worship, and I've been doing this for a while, and, I, and all of a sudden I just began like, oh my, thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you. I'm so grateful. And his love becomes so real. How I many know we don't deserve it? No. So many folks think that they're entitled to God's love. They are not entitled. God does it. But we're not entitled to anything. I mean, God doesn't owe us a thing. And when you realize, man, how me when we realize how messed up we were, and, how, and we were on, when you realize really that we were on the road to hell, yeah. Yeah. that there's judgment. Everybody, everybody wants to, oh, God's a God of, yes, he is. But because he's a God of love. What makes him a God of love is that he's also a God of judgment. Yes, Come on now. Amen. Come on, you can't have love without judgment. You can't, you can't have one without the other because something has to be there to draw us in, to keep us from something and draw us in closer to him. So God is so amazing. See, and, and, and Paul is mixing all these metaphors. And then he used the third word, established. Now, that word established is an architectural term. It refers to the foundation of a building. See, Paul is mixing his metaphors here in order to communicate the importance of having roots and a firm foundation in Christ. He is praying for you and I. He, the Holy Spirit is using this prayer to say, listen, get rooted. Get deeply rooted. Come on now. You know, there's a building in downtown Richmond called the Federal Reserve Bank. How many know what I'm talking about? It's a big building. It's a tall, white building. And that, that's pretty tall. I want to say uh, it was one of my accounts when I fixed computers, so I used to go in there. Uh, but I used to go into the basement. And when you go into the basement of that building, it gets kind of crazy because they're printing money in there. Come on now. And I'm, not, I'm talking a lot. <laughs> I'm talking pallets full of money, like millions of dollars. But something very interesting about that building that many people don't know, that building is nuclear warproof. There is as much building underground as there is above. It's rooted so far down that at the sign of a nuclear war, there's five buildings, five Federal Reserve Banks in the United States. People, certain people are, dis, are, are able to go down underground. There's food stored up for years. I mean, it's a huge thing because they can run, still run the financial system of the nation 
in case of a nuclear war. How many know that's pretty rooted? <laughs> See, God wants us that way. He wants, he wants us to be rooted as deep as we are tall. So that when you're, when you're rooted so deep, have you ever seen a tree get uprooted? There's a huge tree in Forest Hill Park. It used to be right in the center. I lived right across the park for years. I mean, this tree was in the middle of the, like this area, just huge, right on Forest Hill Avenue. And one day there was a huge storm, and it rained for days and days and days. Did you know that that tree got uprooted? And when it got tipped over, you want to hear something crazy? The roots were just as big as the tree. All the branches, when it turned upside down, it looked like a mirror image. The roots were as big as, uh, this tree was huge, but the roots were just as big. So you see, to grow healthy, our roots have to be as big as what we see. See, many times what you see is really dependent on your root system. Come on now. How deep are you going with God? It will show on the outside. The Bible says, that's why, that's why Jesus says it's, it, you can judge them by their fruit. Because I mean, you, can, you can't see roots, but you can see fruits. And the fruits are determined by the roots. Come on now. The healthiness of the tree is completely determined on getting all its nutrition from the ground. So when he starts using these, these term, this terminology, he's saying, listen, are your roots as wide as your branches? Is your foundation as deep as your life is tall? See, God longs to anchor us in his love. And that really is the power, is his love. And the third thing was this. Paul's third request is for comprehension. Ephesians 3.18 says, you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. See, the word grasp here literally means to be made strong to comprehend. So when he says, when he says grasp, he means made strong to understand what God is all about. To be made strong to comprehend his will in your life. See, Paul prays that believers comprehend the enormity of Christ's love. See, it's his love. And he wants the Lord's holy people to take hold of this divine love. You know, bringing people to Christ. How many know the truth makes you free? But how many know truth without grace is judgment? Oh, let me say that one more time. Truth with no grace is just rules and regs. Come on, somebody. Truth without grace might be true, but it's harsh. Grace without truth is wimpy. Come on now. Grace without truth is just, just it, 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 it flops. It, there's, no, there's no strength to it. It's just, it's, everything's acceptable. It's just, it's just grace. It's just grace. But how many know you have to have both? You have to have truth and grace. The truth of God and the love of God together. Because how many know you can preach the truth to the lost, to, 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 to the, uh, the cows come home? You can, you, can, you can correct people all day long. You can be speaking the truth and still sound like a Pharisee. Come on, somebody. Because unless grace is there, unless love is there, then it becomes just another thing, just more rules and regulations that people are trying to accommodate when they can't. Because without God's love, without God's power, we say power. power. Without God's power, you can't walk this thing. Come on now. None of us could walk this walk. Every day we would fail miserably every single day if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit living in us. Amen. And the understanding of that is so huge. And now verse 18 continues by laying out four dimensions of God's love. How wide is it? It's immense. It reaches all people, all nations, and all needs. How long is it? It exists before time. It will never end, and it's unconditional. How high is God's love? It's high enough to take those who are saved all the way to heaven. Come on now. And how deep is the love of God? It's deep enough to rescue the worst sinner. It's deep enough to go to the deepest gutter. Come on, somebody. And go down as deep as it needs to go in any valley, in any place. And still, the love of God can make an impact in their lives. See, the early Christians spoke of the love of God as demonstrated on the cross. See, the cross touched earth, it pointed to heaven, and it stretched out in both directions. So how much does God love you? 
Look at the cross and you'll know. Ephesians 3.19a says, and to know this love, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something, come on now, that surpasses what you know? (laughs) How can knowledge, how, how can you know something that's greater than the knowledge that you even know of it? See, how many know that, have you ever tried describing to somebody what ice cream tastes like? It's almost impossible. Well, it's creamy, it's vanilla. Well, what's vanilla? Well, I mean, how do you explain it? Let me tell you how you know, how you explain it. You give them an ice cream cone. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you give them the ice cream cone. Because how, how do you even try to articulate until they take, come on, until you take the ice cream and put it in your mouth? Now I get it. Now I understand what it tastes like. See, how can we know the love of God that is beyond knowing? Humanly, we can't. See, this kind of knowledge is not intellectual, but divine. It comes from salvation. The only way to really understand it is by experiencing it for yourself. Come on, somebody. There are just some things you got to experience for yourself. You can't explain what God does in your life. You can, they can, you can see the results, but how do you explain that moment? Like, I don't know about you, but when I came to Christ, it was a moment. I could tell you when, what time. I mean, it, it was so radical, and I could tell you, but when I try to explain what it feels like, it's kind of hard because it's, it's love, it's grace, it's mercy, it's joy. It's, it's everything wrapped into one. And all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit touches you like that for the first time, it's like, whoa, dude, what a rush. It was the rush I was looking for the whole time. Come on, I thought I could find it in in weed and drinking and partying. See, I I thought that that was the high I was looking for. Man, there is no high. Come on, somebody. Like when the Holy Spirit shows up in your life and sucks all the sin out of your life, and all of a sudden you're going, man, this is it. It's the pearl of great price that the Bible talks about. When you find the real thing, how many know we don't need any more counterfeits? We don't need anything that looks like it, smells like it. We know what the real thing is now. And that makes such a huge difference. And you see, it's so amazing. See, the word, I I love, as as we finish this, this part up here, it says that, and I love what it says here, the fourth request is fullness. Paul's fourth petition is for believers to experience God's Fullness. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I am full. Isn't there something good about being full? After you've just had a good meal, come on, somebody. And you you just topped it off, man. And all of a sudden you're sitting there going, man, it feels good to be full. It feels good to be satisfied. It feels good to know that, man, I don't need anything outside of this. I don't need anything the world has to offer. I don't need anything that, 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 I, that I think I want myself. When you have the fullness of God's love in your heart and your life, man, it's a place of contentment. Come on, somebody. It's a place where restlessness goes out the door. See, a lot of folks are so restless. They always got to be moving because they're always looking for the next rush. They're, they're always looking for the next, uh, the next thing to do. They, they, they can't. They're, they're never satisfied. But when you come to Jesus, come on, somebody. And all of a sudden you experience God's peace and his grace. I don't have to go outside to be stimulated. I don't have to go out to try to find this peace anymore because God's peace dominates my life. See, how do you contain the uncontainable? See, in Ephesians 13b, it says that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. See, as believers, we've been created to be containers of God. You've been called to be a container. You are the ark of the covenant. Inside of you is God's presence. So everywhere you go, God goes with you. Because you are the vessel. The Bible says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that means God lives in you. As long as you keep welcoming him. Come on, somebody. Because the Bible says you can't grieve the Holy Spirit. You got to be careful where we go, the things that we do, because the Holy Spirit will will have to walk out on you if you go into a place you don't need to go. How many know what I'm talking about? If we we start going to websites we shouldn't go to, how many know the Holy Spirit is going to walk out? There's certain things that we need to understand that God is with you, but at the same time, as long as you keep welcoming him, come on. And the good news is this. When you welcome him in, you don't ever want him to leave. I love what David said. He said, he said, God, 
please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Come on, renew in me a clean heart. I mean, I just fell hard. I mean, I just did some crazy stuff. But Lord, please, please don't take the Holy Spirit. It's your presence. It's your power. It's what keeps me sane. It's what keeps me going forward. I, I need it. And you see, uh, as a believer, we're created to be containers, and he, he wants to pour his life into ours and fill us until we're full of God. See, the word filled comes from the word that means to be overflowing like a cup that is running over. So you see, it's not enough just to be filled. God wants to overfill you. He wants to fill you in abundance so that, that his presence will overflow from your cup. And it will go down into the saucer and around the table. And everybody sitting around you gets touched. And everybody that comes in contact with you knows that they're in, a con they're in the presence of somebody that's been with God. Come on now. See, they know they can sense something about you because God wants to not just fill you. He wants to overfill you. Oh, man. That's so good. God is so amazing. See, it means total dominance. To come to the place in your life where you are totally overwhelmed by God's presence. Do you experience the fullness of God on a regular basis? You know you can. You can refill yourself with God every day. Every day. See, every morning, you should, the first thing you should do is, is refill your tank. Come on, somebody. But at the first thing in the morning, you need to fill it up all the way to the top. You need to start worshiping the Lord, praising God, reading your Bible. Don't let anybody else take your sovereignty. Come on, somebody. Don't answer any phone calls too early in the morning. Don't go on your Facebook too early in the morning. Go into your faith book. Come on, somebody. Begin to, begin to start putting your face where it belongs, in God's book. Begin to seek God and fill up your tank. Because how many know by the end of the day, it will be depleted? Come on now. So if you start off on empty, come on now, you'll be on fumes all day. How many have been there before? Come on, we've all been there, been on fumes. We, maybe we got too busy, we rolled out the house, we didn't have time, we got caught up. And by the end of the day, I'm like, oh my goodness, I am exhausted. But the days when you get up and fill up your tank, come on now, and you fill it up all the way filled to the top, so it's flowing over. Then you, the, you, the day doesn't attack you. You attack it. Come on, somebody. So you attack the day. And you, and you take control. You dominate what's happening around you. And you walk in a way that God can bless you and put you in places that you need to be. See, are you willing to say, Lord, fill me up so that my life is all you and none of me? And finally, the third part. Finally, the third part of this is this. Finally, the third part is, is praise. The third part of his prayer is praise. Praise God. The worship team should be coming out here about right now. Finally, the third part is praise. Ephesians 3.20. Ha, ha, I love this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that, all, that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. So you see, when you see these parts of what we just talked about, those four areas that he wants you to understand, the fullness, the comprehension, the love of God. See, now, oh, now God is able to do abundantly. Come on. He's able to do it. See, a lot of folks quote that scripture, but, they don't, but if you're not doing the first four things we just read, then you're not going to see that moving in your life. See, some folks are walking in sin, but they want the blessing. Come on now. Some people are walking in a way, they, they're disobedient, they know it, but then they'll quote the scripture and expect God to do it. Say, well, wait a minute. Read the stuff before it. Come on, somebody. There's a process to walk in the exceedingly abundant blessing of God. God doesn't do that for just everyone. He does it for those that fear him and love him. Come on, somebody. Those that fear, man, God begins to pour out his spirit, and that promise is for every one of us that begins to walk in what God has for us. And I want you to take this home with you. Inside your, inside your, uh, your, your, your paper there, there should be a, a, fill, a little fill-in, right? There was a sheet inside your, your fill-in-the-blank thing. Okay, what it is is I gave you the scripture that I just quoted. This whole scripture, this whole passage of scripture, I gave it to you. Why? Because I, wanna do, I, wanna do, I want you to do some homework. I want you to put that, that paper somewhere that you can see it every day. Put it, in your, put it on your mirror. Put it on your car. Put it somewhere. And what I want you to do is I want you to take that and pray it every day. Just do it for a week. 
It might get, who knows, your life may get so turned around in one week, you might just make this a regular habit. How many of this is a good habit? Oh, yeah. To speak these things over yourself. Yeah. See, after, after contemplating the joy of experiencing God's power, after exploring the depths of God's love, after trying to grasp all that he has for us, after striving to be filled with the fullness of God himself, Paul bursts into glorious moment of praise. Look at what God is able to do in verse 20. First thing he said is, he is able. Everybody say, he is able. He is able. That means there's nothing impossible for God. Then it says, he is able to do. See, God is not idle or asleep. God is active. God is always doing something. He is able to do immeasurably more. See, his abilities are higher than your requests. See, anything, anything you ask for, he can do so much more than that. He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask. That means he's listening. Mm. He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Imagine. He can read your thoughts. He can read your mind. The devil can't. Come on, somebody. Just so you know, the devil is not all-knowing. But God can read your mind. So no matter how much you imagine, how big of an imagination do you have? Because some of us need to start imagining things. Because when you imagine them, you begin to see them. And when you begin to see them, God begins to do them. So how big of an imagination do you have? God says more than you can ever imagine. God reads our thoughts. He is able to do this according to his power that's, work, that's at work within us. God does all this through the Holy Spirit that is already in you. God has given us the key. He's given us the vehicle. And we're sitting in it already. Just got to take the key and put it in the ignition. Come on, somebody. You got the key, you got the car. So what are we waiting for? <laughs> Put it in the ignition. It's time to get ignited. Come on, somebody. It's time for the Holy Spirit to turn. The engine won't turn by itself. You got to put the key. He's already given you everything that you need. And we just got to step into it. Amen. See, God wants to do something great and mighty. He's already in us. So we need to tap what's already in us. See, Ephesians 3.21 says this as I close. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. In other words, as we utilize the power God has given us, God receives the glory. See, God receives the glory when you walk in what he's already given you. Oh, man, this side didn't get it. Let me go on this side for a minute. God gets all the glory when you use the power that he's already given you. See, a lot of us are going, Lord, give me more power. Give me more power. I've given you the power. You have it. You're not using what you already got. Come on, somebody. And you're asking for more. Come on. <laughs> oh, action steps. Pray that prayer. I gave it to you guys every day on a regular basis. Ask for God to change your inner person. Pray that prayer. Now, the second thing is this. Pray it over other people as well. Amen. Insert their name. Insert your child into that thing. Insert your husband, your spouse. Insert your mom and dad. Insert somebody that's in need and begin to pray this over them as well. And the third thing is this. Think of an impossible situation. Think of something that's so impossible and it's so ridiculous that anybody, if you told anybody about it, they thought you were absolutely nuts? See, is there something you're facing that seems beyond hope? Is there, are, you, are you hitting some walls right now that are beyond comprehension? Make a decision to trust God to do immeasurably more than all you can ask, think, or imagine according to the power that's already in us. It's already in you. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. God's got you. Praise God. I want to close with this. This is so good. A girl turned to her mother, a little young girl, after church and said, Mommy, the pastor's sermon was confusing today. The mother asked, Why? Why is that, honey? The little girl answered, Well, he said that God is bigger than we are. Is that true? Well, yes, that's true, the mother replied. 
he also said that God lives within us. Is that true? She goes, yes, that's true. Well, said the little girl, if God is bigger than us and he lives in us, wouldn't he show through? Is God showing through in your life? Oh, I'm not going to give the Lord a praise. Come on. Let's all stand up.